voice collecting all, all the other voices for all the answers. And um, I've been personally myself exploring what it means for engineers to embrace this AI wave. Um, so like people who code, uh, people who can, and, and the, the main thesis is that people who code can wield AI much more powerfully than people who prompt. Um, that seems self-evident, but um, I think the implications of this are not well understood if you really think that out. Okay, so um, I figured out I would just kind of do a retrospective, and then um, this would set the table effectively for all the discussions that you guys are going to have between, between yourselves. Um, I think one thing that's not obvious is maybe that ChatGPT was kind of, uh, at, the, at the sort of strictest level, five years in the making. Um, 2017 was attention is all you need, but then GPT is one, two, and three. Um, actually created by Alec Radford, who does not have a PhD, just took three years off from his undergrad. Um, very, very interesting story there. We, I'm, I'm sort of hoping and working on getting Alec on our podcast uh, soon enough. Um, he actually has a nice two hour long lecture on the entire history of LLMs, given like right before GPT 3 was launched. If you're interested in hearing from the guy who created GPT, um, you should look it up. I think it only has like 10,000 views. It's, it's really ridiculous. Um, in 2021, we discovered the value of adding code to language models, and that's Codex. Um, and since then, all GPT variants, uh, three and a half, four, and now five, um, are all trained from a code uh, sort of uh, base and standpoint. We also uh, discovered the importance of sort of instruction following, instruction tuning, um, and all that led up to GPT 3.5, which was uh, released a day before uh, ChatGPT. Um, we also now know that GPT-4, the reason that ChatGPT was uh, not expected to be, sorry, <laughs> the reason that ChatGPT was not expected to be a big deal was because OpenAI internally had GPT-4 uh, trained for six months before they released ChatGPT. Um, the, the, in fact, Bill Gates um, went on a podcast, I think one of the Microsoft Research podcasts, um, talking about how he had a demo of GPT-4 in August and he was blown away by it. So when they released ChatGPT with only GPT-3.5 in November, a year ago, uh, they were like, this is not going to be a big deal. We have GPT-4 internally. We know how much better it could be. Uh, but the rest of us didn't. <laughs> so ChatGPT timeline. This is um, the past year, as I can sort of summarize the highlights, and that we've covered on our podcast. Um, I kind of called November 30th the day that AGI was born. Um, then, we had, then we launched our podcast in February with OpenAI, uh, just kind of launched, kicking off that whole, that whole space. Um, in March, we had the GPT-4 demo, which was uh, what Greg Bachman showed with uh, the first introduction of Vision, um, as well as uh, just, just the, 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 the much better instruction following that GPT-4 had. Uh, in March, they also launched plugins a week later, which was not fun, because I was traveling on a holiday in Japan, and then I had to cover <laughs> this thing. <laughs> I was like, you guys, you guys were done, right, with GPT-4? Um, we had the Google sort of freak out in, um, or sort of uh, red warning, um, in, in May, um, June, we had the Functions API, July, Code Interpreter, October, Fine Tuning, October, uh, Voice, TTS, Vision, Dolly 3, all released uh, a couple weeks before OpenAI Dev Day, which was uh, last week, I think, or two weeks ago. Cool. Um, obviously, OpenAI is only one part of the story. Um, there's also all the other companies, um, Meta, uh, Microsoft, Falcon, which is not really a company, it's a sort of institute in the UAE. Um, Anthropic, Inflection, Mosaic, Google, and all that good stuff. And most recently, Mistral, which um, is our current kings of open source AI, which is uh, the, sort of the, the feature piece in our latest week's newsletter. So I'm uh, happy to talk about all these. We just do not have the space to cover all of that in, in this kind of presentation. Um, I do want to, you know, I, I'm very, we are very text heavy and code heavy and reasoning heavy. Um, I do want to cover images, right? Like, um, Actually, the, the, the proximate reason for why I started the space was not ChatGPT, because I started you know, in, in, you know, like a, year, a year ago before ChatGPT. Uh, it was actually stable diffusion. Um, I, I, I do think that um, if, anything, if, if anything is the most stark, um, it is the uh, progress in, in terms of our capability to generate images um, to do things that we never thought computers could do. In 2014, this was the state of the art. Um, you know, you know, shout out if you know. Uh, if you remember, like this person does not exist, right? And this and this is just all just generating like really cl closely cropped faces, and, and now we complain if uh, the dogs that we placed um, in an image isn't in the right order. Um, it, it is a huge, huge, huge improvement, um, and I would say in approximately the last week, um, that I mean this this is 
continuing, this is not ended, right? Um, it used to take me about like a minute, two minutes to generate images on my desktop, on my, on my laptop with um, stable diffusion. And now we can do it in about one to two seconds uh, with uh, consistency models. And that's the, that's the thing that you should be, you should be that's, uh, that's been blowing up on Twitter. Um, it's, a, it's something that's been promised for a while, like sort of real time uh, generation, uh, and now and, and so now like it's very it's very much possible to just kind of just sketch stuff, prompt it, and then generate an, an app, and then move your sketch around and see it li update live as well. Um, and so that's a very that unlocks a very very different kind of workflow uh, as far as images is going. Um, so I put in the Balenciaga Young Home because that's one of the <laughs> the biggest um, images. But even then, you can sort of see the uh, the, the image quality improvements that Midjourney V5 has has shipped. Um, and then I'll, I'll briefly cover this because it's relevant to the investing that Decibel does, uh, building on top of the stack that Microsoft offers. Uh, and really, it's, it's, the, it's my main theme for the year, which is the rise of the AI engineer. Um, and the main thesis uh, is this chart, which is that the traditional MLE, ML research stack um, is going to remain and, and going to be specializing, probably going to concentrate towards the ML model as a service companies. Uh, but more, increasingly more of them are going to cl be closed source. Increasingly more of them um, are going to uh, uh, you know, sort of throw their models over uh, the API wall um, and serve it to uh, a specialization of the full stack engineer called the AI engineer. Um, and these people will be the ones building chains, uh, rag, uh, you know, apps and all, the, all that good stuff and specializing in reading all the latest and greatest papers. Um, it is not enough to just be a software engineer. Um, you will probably want to specialize if you want to uh, be on the cutting edge of this stack. And I ran a conference to that effect. Um, and th there's, there's definitely a few themes that we've been tracking throughout the entire year um, that have emerged from this. And, and this, this is my, my best recap from a sociology point of view of the past year. Um, so first of all, we have GPU hoarding. Um, you cannot buy, there's, there's about one million, uh, we're actually putting out a podcast tomorrow with a semi-analysis guy who created the term of GPU rich, GPU poor. Um, and uh, most of you in this room uh, are GPU poor. Um, you cannot buy the, the GPUs that you need uh, to compete on the same level as the GPU rich GPUs. Um, most, uh, not, not least because uh, there's a lot of money that's, that's being raised to, to spend on this. Um, I would say that this image is from the Stability AI uh, presentation of fundraising, which was a year ago. Um, and he was, the, I, think, I think Imad was the first one to actually kick off this sort of like boasting about GPUs, how many GPUs we have. And now like that's a, that's a form of recruitment for, <laughs> for companies. Um, and and it, it is very valid if you intend to play the GPU rich playbook. Um, that's, the, that's on the hardware side. On the software side, um, it's pretty clear that um, the, the barrier to entry for being an ML engineer, LLM engineer, is probably only about like five to five, 50,000 of these in the world. Um, and they're not going to grow significantly, uh, but the demand for this is going to far out the supply. Therefore, mathematically, there will be a lot more AI engineers than ML engineers. Um, sociologically as well, like uh, I, I advise a few companies, working uh, worked in a few of them. Um, what started out as a single, hey, like there's a lot of AI stuff going on. Let's just put it. Let's make a Slack channel for it. And then it's like, all right, here's a bunch of threads. <laughs> uh, and now it's just taken over the Discord that Alessio and I have run for the, uh, the last uh, three years. Um, and, and so, so my, my assertion is that what eventually what starts out as a nights and weekends like hobby thing in formal Slack groups within any company becomes the formal AI team because the, all, all of these sort of, uh, AI sort of obsessed people uh, start becoming um, you know very serious and, and wanting to do it at their work uh, and then becomes a part of the formal company strategy whatever they ship the products that they want to work on. Um, I do want to say, like everything, I've, uh, every comment I've made so far is very much um, economics, demand, supply, sociology. Um, can it, it, it is not fundamental or first principles in terms of what is driving this, uh, except for this point I'm going to make, which is uh, about foundation models uh, being very, very different from the previous class of ML, where you had to create sort of single domain-specific things, and you were you're mostly um, classifying, uh, you're mostly uh, you know improving things by a few percentage points. Uh, whereas here, uh, you are doing whole, wholly new things, um, being enabled by in-context learning, zero-shot zero, zero shot transfers, and few-shot learning, um, all of which are backed up in research, and um, I, don't have more, I don't have space, but uh, effectively, I think, uh, I think basically there is, a, there is a why now, if you want to point to like a technological why now instead of like an economic and sociological why now. Um, I do really like as well, um, which is the, I think the second last point I make, um, the product uh, velocity as, as a business person, as a, as a former PM, um, 
in traditional ML, you used to have to collect a whole bunch of data, and then you have to train the model, and then maybe you would ship it into products and you would improve things by a few percent. Uh, whereas with foundation models uh, and AI engineers, you're basically shipping products first to like try to see if it, it, it has a fit. Then, if it's successful, then you get a whole bunch of data from active users, then you fine tune or train your model. It really is a fire ready aim instead of ready aim fire. Finally, uh, there's just a total addressable market expansion. Um, ML was very much traditionally Python, uh, and now it is pretty much language agnostic, but the, the second biggest community would be JavaScript. Um, and so it's tackling, it's dumping at least the sheer number of engineers and the sheer number of people who build uh, with these tools. So that's the five reasons uh, that, that we can go over. Um, and by the way, all of this is on my website. Uh, I'll tweet this out, but you don't have to record this. <laughs> um, and I also, in, in a separate talk, go over like the central problems and, and how people solve it. But I think relevant to this crowd and to relevant to Decibel, relevant to Microsoft, is what the emerging sort of um, AI stack looks like. Like, where do you want to build? Um, and I, I most recently came from data engineering, where I worked in the sort of data pipelines. Uh, and the modern data stack is about 10, 12, 13 years old. And it looks like this now. Uh, you can see the same thing probably happening to the AI stack. Um, and, and right now, the modern data stack is undergoing uh, a lot of consolidation. There's been way too much money invested in very, very niche ideas, and people are sort of merging, combining, acquiring, or shutting down. Um, and recently, Ben Stansel, who was a, was a really uh, insightful thought leader, I think, uh, in this space, was like, all right, instead of all these logos where every logo has equal weight, let's just go talk about like, who makes money. Um, and who, what the main valuations are. So, um, you know, there's, there's a system of record, which is, for them is a data warehouse, uh, Databricks and Snowflake, um, together worth about $100 billion. You have your user interfaces, which is sort of the Tableau and ThoughtSpot and sort of BI tooling. And then you have the pipes between them, uh, which is the least valuable of all of them. Um, and then you have all the sort of orchestration tools, which is unclear. Like, that, it, they're all important. Uh, we're not sure how much uh, sort of the, the total sort of end value of the market would be. So that's the data stack. That, that's the, sort of the evolution from like big chart into like, like hey, these, these are the things that we actually think are valuable just based on money changing hands. Um, what's going to happen to the AI stack? Uh, there's a, this huge explosion. I strongly encourage you to have a mental model of this because it will help you cut through all the noise um, to, to understand, all right, this is what is valuable, this is not. So here's a chart from uh, Andreessen Horowitz. I'm not specifically recommending this thing, but I think this is the best executed one of uh, a lot of the sort of market map charts that I see out there. Um, but like, what would be the equivalent of that, uh, the Ben Stencil chart from data into AI? Uh, this is what I have today. Um, <laughs> since I made this, the numbers are now out of date. Opening eyes, instead of 40 billion, is now 80 billion. And topics now, <laughs> instead of 5 billion, is now 20. So <laughs> um, uh, you have to update this every month. Uh, but you have the foundation models which are closed source, you have the open source models which are open source, you have the vector DBs, which we'll talk about later, uh, you have the you have sort of orchestration pipes, and then you have the sort of big question marks for user interfaces. Um, I can talk about each of these, you know, um, and, and like each of these are part of the one year of ChatGPT. A lot of these are just kind of burst into the public consciousness and burst into the stack discussions that people are having, and everyone's trying to figure all of this out. Um, and I do, you know, we don't really have a ton of time, but I'll, I'll, post, I'll post all this up online uh, if you go onto my website and you, you already see the slides. Um, uh, the, the main thing I'll see, uh, I'll, I'll start here is uh, a lot of people just ask us for where to start uh, <laughs> because it, it is overwhelming. And if you, if you are a software engineer, if you're sort of technically competent, um, I think people want to know like where, uh, you know, what, what is our curation of good starting points. Um, so I basically have created a seven day course, it's free forever. Uh, we already recorded uh, an in-person live workshop which is now uh, on YouTube. So start there if you want. Um, it's a sample of like the main things, the main capabilities that I think everyone should know. Um, and beyond that, those are the, these are, these are what I consider resolved questions. Everyone should know this. Everyone should have a familiarity with this because if you don't know about this stuff, like you don't know AI at all. Um, but the open questions are stuff that we're actively investigating on the pod, and I think we'll take up year two of uh, ChatGPT, uh, which is about how do new foundation models differentiate? Uh, it used to be long context. Anthropic came out with a 100K context model uh, in March, and now everyone has 100K context, even in open source. So that's not a differentiator. Now it's multimodality. OK, that's going to take us another year, and then what? Um, hallucinations, vector databases, open LLM research. Um, I think there will be some kind of AI winter um, it will probably be in the agents field because people, that's where 
the most people are promising things that don't work yet. Um, and the most money has been raised against things that don't work yet. Um, when do we deploy smaller models? And then the most, uh, the, the fun sort of dinner party conversation is what replaces Transformers and NVIDIA, which uh, is also available for discussion. We're happy to discuss all these. If you have guests that you want to hear um, us interview on these open questions, we're open to that too. So thank you. Um, if you want to check out more, go to AI Engineer for all the talks that we did on our recent conference and Linspace for the podcast. Thanks very much.